So if you guys wanted to just introduce yourself and then talk about whatever you want, we can proceed with questions whenever you want. We can talk about your life, how Indie City started, how it's going on, anything really. All right, take it away. <laughs> Tante, everyone. I think I've met everybody that's here today. Um, I'm Angel Obishan. I'm one of the co-founders of Indie City. Um, I'm from the Papika Sioux Cree Nation. I grew up in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan, which is in northern Saskatchewan. We actually just came from the north, and it was so nice to cross the north, north Saskatchewan and just kind of smell the boreal and now we're in um, Jasper, Alberta right now, and we're just taking a breather. It's been a really awesome but busy couple years. <laughs> and this is kind of the first time we've taken a little, little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Taking naps. Yeah. Taking naps. Yeah. It's so good <laughs> to be here, though. And um, I'm, let's just, I, I'll let Alex introduce herself. Hi, I'm Alex Manitopius. Um, so I was born and raised in Calgary, but my family is from the Fort Capel area, um, Papikasis and Muskogwin. And yeah, basically my grandmother left the res in the 60s and came all the way from Fort Capel to Calgary. And they were one of like the first indigenous families in the city in the 60s. <clears throat> um, I am Cree and Ishnabe and yeah. Co-founder of Indie City. So did you guys want to speak about like how Indie City started? What made you guys like, pro like pursue this? Yeah, for sure. It was, it was kind of, it wasn't a really, there wasn't a huge scene for Indigenous fashion when I started beating. It wasn't a thing yet. Um, I got into fashion it was something I always wanted to do and I always wanted to design and I used to like it's the whole story like making clothes for your Barbies kind of thing and um, uh, what was it 10 11 years ago I went to a Sundance and I was sitting there beating and I had an elder tell me that how you are at ceremony is how you are in life and I was sitting there beating like I had finished my work. I had done some stuff and there was a little lull and I found myself and really loving it. And um, at the time I wanted to be a powwow dancer. So I was trying to make an outfit and I actually never did finish the outfit, but I found beating in, this, in the same time. And um, I realized that it was something that my, that was in my family, my great grandma, she was a beater and she lived off the land and she made these beautiful florals and vests and moccasins and stuff. And I had this ability, like I just picked it up really fast and I really loved it. And I started like thinking about blood memory and how we always carry a little bit of our, our, our ancestors with us and the things that we do and the things that we're gifted at and we're born with these gifts and it's just about like accessing that blood memory so that was really the beginning of indie city for me was back then and then i thought i wanted to do like a a, a street style blog and i started doing that a little bit for a local publication in calgary called new tribe magazine and i would just um, do profiles on local fashion forward folks and um kept doing the beating and I wasn't really selling anything. It was more or less just giving things away and making little things here and there. And then the beating started to take off and uh, it wasn't something that I really thought, oh, I'm gonna make a living out of doing this. It was just more like something I really liked doing. And then Alex and I met mm -hmm. and um, Alex, at the time, I'll let you tell about your digital media stuff. Yeah, so we met in um, 2014, and um, yeah, very early in our relationship, we wanted to start 
we wanted to work together and we wanted to start some kind of business and um, the things that we had to offer at the time that we had in common was photography, um, being an artist, Angel was um, beating and um, I was working um, at the casino in Calgary and I wanted to find a way where I could create a job for myself and do do what I'm meant to do and find ways, find a job to be an artist basically. So I went back to school, I went to say, and uh, I took me new media production and design. And basically you learn all the digital stuff and you learn like um, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, like graphic design, video production, um, web design, app design, like basically all the multimedia stuff that you need to know. And um, I graduated in 2017. It was a two year um, program at SAFE, but basically we had this idea about Indie City in the beginning. Um, and I basically, with all the assignments, I tried to um, include Indie City, like if there was a business plan that we needed to like learn how to do on a um on a business it was indie city or if it was a web design it was going to be indie city it all like and i had like this group of um that basically these two friends that we just stuck together for the two years and they helped me like work on indie city basically like for all our group assignments and it was really cool because we got to kind of see like what directions it could go and how it could shape be shaped and it it was it was just like the aesthetic that we were going towards was like minimalized or minimalistic and clean and but we were still missing the service and product. <laughs> so when I graduated in 2017, I did a um, practicum with Make Fashion and they're um, a nonprofit that, um, I don't know if you guys heard of Make Fashion, if um, Angel has shown you any of the shawls or the light up regalia that, sh that she made for um, Make Fashion for the runway. Um, so that's where I did my practicum and then that's where Angel did her first shawl and they offer a lot of cool stuff like um, 3D printing, laser cutter, um, basically like how to make um, gowns and scissors and, and put um, different LED lights on them. So anyways, that's when you made the matriarch speaks, right? Mm -hmm. And then they had a laser cutter, so they kind of mentored us on that machine. And then that's when, that's when we started with the acrylics, um, designing them and um, coming up with the different designs, um, using my um, graphic design skills for that, and then getting them to mentor us on how to use the machine. and. We were just like kind of playing around with the idea, right? And then it just, I don't know, it just worked. It just was bold statement earrings, you know, it just took off. Have you guys watched season 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race? No, there, it, it, it's like the best finale ever. Um, the Queen Sasha Velour won that season and she was wearing these like huge statement earrings and I was wondering what they were made out of and here they were made out of acrylics so that was the first um, inspiration for acrylic earrings was Sasha Velour. Um, the company that made hers is called Isla NYC. They're based out of New York. They're a non-indigenous company but they make really cool statement pieces um, and all the earrings that I had been making at the time were always huge and I'd said that they were like stiletto earrings for the ears and we needed to find something that was lightweight because there was a lot of folks that didn't um, couldn't wear them my beadwork but yeah that's kind of the beginning I like guess I think the very <laughs> first um, design that we experimented with was the 
bison horns. I don't know if you've seen them. So they're the original ones, and we're we making both, a comeback because yeah. you, you put up a post of your beaded bison horns, mm -hmm. and that was where the inspiration came from. Hey, we both have bison. We're both from the bison name uh, nation. My name is Muscade Bezaki Quay. I was given that name by a Medeoan uh, lodge bundle carrier. And when we took the Indigenous Women in Community Leadership Program, we were all out there. And I had always, in the Treaty 7 area, been given these, like, standby names. So there was, like, Cree Woman and Blackfoot and something else. And they were just names that I was called in ceremony. But I felt like I really needed a name that spoke to me specifically and what it was that I brought. And a um, friend, one of our Ivalco sisters, said that there's this name that you give to people when they don't have a name or they don't know their name yet and so that's the name that I took it's like a placeholder it's a placeholder <laughs> name <laughs> but Alex is also carries a name from the bison nation so that was the inspiration between but behind the logo um, Alex did the graphic design but it was I gave her words that I wanted to see and one was ancient and one was future and we wanted to mix the two together and kind of juxtapose the idea of contemporary and traditional in a different sort of way and that's kind of i guess the essence of indie city is taking these old ideas and and um creating a contemporary way that resonates with people in the design um yeah mm -hmm. yeah Oh yeah, there you Woo! go. Everyone's got those five boards. <laughs> yes. Those are the OGs. Those are the yeah, for sure. Yeah, as soon as we cut oh, them. As soon oh, as they do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love nice. it. Nice. Right on. Wait, no, it's oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can we show yours? Oh, <laughs> those are so nice. I remember That's literally those. the first collection of Indie City acrylics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, there were, there's so much that goes to the story. Like, I think really we need to sit down and learn how to articulate our story. Mm -hmm. When we were in um, the Indigenous Women in Community Leadership Program, it was the first time that we actually sat with a group of Indigenous women and learned how to introduce ourselves. And it's something that we're a little bit out of practice with. And I know it's really important to be able to reclaim the language and the, the space that we're from and talk about that stuff. And it's something that we're, we're like I said, out of practice with. <laughs> <laughs> But um, this is a good reminder that that's something that we need to start um, incorporating all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so good to, to see those original pieces because it's like you, you create something and you put it out into the world and you don't know if anyone's going to receive it. And then they do and they get it and it resonates and it just, it's like, this is the reason why we do what we do is because we want people to feel represented in what's available out there. I remember being a little girl when there was so much out there that didn't re resonate with me. Um, and yeah, that's like the foundation mm -hmm. of Indie City is just creating that representation and that authenticity. The first, the fashion blog that I actually started, um, and it, it just wasn't meant to be. It was called Indianicity, and it was kind of like reclaiming the word Indian and putting an authentic spin onto that word. Word. And then I just thought, oh, I don't know if I want to really put that out there so much. I don't want this misnomer to be something that I'm known for. And then we just broke up the ANI and Indie City. And it's like Indigenous City, Independent City, anything indie. Mm -hmm. I'm going off on tangents. <laughs> Maybe you guys should ask some questions. <laughs> um, okay, so how has like quarantine like social distancing had like an effect on indie city like i personally see like creativity flowing but like from your guys's point like how has it been for you do you want to go or should i i think it's actually made us more like busier 
because everything is online now, like online shopping are, yeah, we've definitely been way more busier on our website and a lot of time to um, create as well. There is a lot of events um, stacked up for spring and summer and it was actually kind of relieving because we were kind of feeling that burnt out point and it was great to just like come back to ourselves and realign our vision for Indie City rather than just like go 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 it was like it was hard to like see forward and now it's like we kind of have that plan and we feel it and it's actually been a blessing Mm -hmm. I know it's been difficult for a lot of folks, but um, I've always kind of lived this way. I've always kind of had a quarantine lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, nothing has changed. I, know. I, was, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, there's some word for our, our lifestyle. It's called quarantine. <laughs> We're homebodies and yeah, we never go out and it was just, everyone was quarantined with us, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We had company more often <laughs> online. <laughs> yeah. A lot of like first time Zoom calls for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we still haven't quite got the hang of it yet. <laughs> how about you guys? How how is quarantine? How has things been for you with through the quarantine? Um, honestly, it's all A7G that keeps me occupied during quarantine. The past few months have been crazy. But uh, yeah, I mean, A7, Gabby, Josh, either any of y'all can talk about what you've been doing. I'm only like a helper, so. I'm glad, yeah. I'm just a helper too, but uh <laughs> <laughs> I think um I don't know I, I guess we've just been yeah we've had to go online I guess uh, because of like social distancing we, we the way we work is like close community being around young people but yeah COVID's kind of just but it's allowed us to like create this platform for example so the tea and chat was kind of created by one of our elders who said maybe we should start having conversations with you know different folks across Turtle Island and just checking in with everyone and so that's what we've been doing since since COVID started. Really, we've been like yeah, having different chats with like all of our relatives across Turtle Island, different from all different walks of life too, which is really great. So I guess yeah, in a way, we've become bu busier too, but at home. So it's like yeah, just <laughs> yeah, we're just real busy. But I don't know if you want to add anything. To that. Yeah, like um, I think like our story is like similar too, like how we got started um so you know like people would it was kind of like around that time where where people really started talking about reconciliation and so you know they'd like ask us to like go on like a panel or like talk about reconciliation and um which is great and and really important but i always like wanted to bring it back to something like i didn't want it to just be like like here but have nothing to to come back to um and so i'd always be like yeah and then you guys should follow a7g <laughs> mm -hmm. and like really try to get people to come back to like the center or like a community or something because it just seemed like we were just like throwing that word out there with like no like tangible actions and so yeah as you were talking about um, like your beginnings a little bit kind of reminded me of how we got started too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Danny, did you want to share anything? Because you're also one of our co CEOs. A helper. A helper, yeah. Whatever that word is there. Just give me Yeah. Yeah, I'm just a helper. I'm just in the background. Just kidding. Um, yeah, it's been cool. I think like um, COVID has actually made our programming I don't even like calling it programming but um what we do I guess um a little more accessible in some ways um definitely not for everyone there's still those challenges of like folks not being able to afford wi-fi or even coming from areas where um you just can't get 
a strong enough signal to actually join in on a Zoom call. Um, but yeah, I definitely think like if we didn't have A7G going, the pandemic would have been very different for a lot of folks. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been cool to like be able to have these uh, these tea and chats and just hear from, from really cool people every week. So yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> So I'm from hearing what y'all said, um, I'm kind of guessing that Indie City is kind of what kept you guys occupied and safe during like the isolation period. Um, so is there anything like you want to share, like major changes you feel? I mean, you guys said you were homebodies, which like, it's not really different, but like, is there anything that has changed a lot? No, really just just growth I guess yeah. I think um, actually our communication working within Indie City and talking about what's coming next because it's kind of like we just read each other's mind on the basics and then and then we go with it but we've had a lot of time to kind of organize a little bit more what's going what's going to happen going forward um, and think about the next collections and how that relates to things. Um, we just finished our Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto collection and the original idea that we submitted was like there was a lot going on with it. There was a lot about tech and doing another, um, creating another look for one of, we were going to do a grass dance outfit um, and the whole show got moved to online so we had to kind of reinvent how we wanted to talk about this and one of the things that I've noticed is that um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of our indie city supporters and customers wearing the earrings during their Zoom calls, and there's kind of this new fashion thing going on, this new trend where you get ready from like the waist up just for the Zoom call, and then you're wearing pajamas and moccasins on, underneath. So we kind of wanted to go with that idea of just how. Um, we, we present this, right? This is what we're presenting now to the world for the most part when we're connecting. And we took the idea, or well, we worked with my, uh, my, my great aunt sent me my Cookham's heirloom beadwork. And it was actually pieces for a Métis beadwork jacket, one of the fringe buckskin trapper jackets. And it, it never got put together, but she had beaded all the pieces for it. So what we did was we digitized the design and then changed the colors to resonate with the collection. And the next acrylic collection that you'll see coming from Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto is actually my Cookham's beadwork. So bringing the elements of like, uh, my aunt told me stories of Cookham going out into the bush. And those are things that we can still do even though we're in this time where we have to connect online more than in person. And uh, we can still go out to the bush and we can still ground. We can still pick the muskiki. We can still talk to the ancestors and be present with Nibi and all of those elements. We wanted to bring that into the collection, but we're presenting it in this like juxtaposed kind of, it's made out of plastic and, it's, and you're wearing it, but it's still this ancient design tied to the land and just kind of going with all those ideas. And that's what the pandemic inspired with, with Indie City in our next next direction for design. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so who are some of your guys' main inspirations? Mm -hmm. Section, section 35. Yeah, I like how he um, is like politically charged with his designs. And I like how he takes like iconic like symbols and indigenizes them. I think that's really cool. Like native people have been doing that for years with different icons. Like, do you guys remember Bannock Power back in the eighties, the Bannock Power t-shirts? I don't know if you guys know, but you should look it up. It's really cool. Like, we always like, like to take these graphics and indigenize them, right? And so, it's it's cool to see like things that are like trending or relatable especially relatable to the youth you know or to like 
yeah, to our indigenous people, like they could see like iconic symbol and then see it indigenized is cool rather than like seeing like a, a tacky like gift shop t-shirt, you know, that's supposed to represent us. Like that's not cool. <laughs> that's what we do. Why that's why we do what we do. Like we wanna make sure that we have our flavor and our styles out there. That that's not just us. That's not what represents us, you know. And that's what I like about section 35 too. Yeah. About you. Um biggest inspirations. For like Are we talking like, like design generally? or in general, like people that we we admire? It could be either or, you know, like people you admire or just like Yeah, I mean people you admire just in general would work. <laughs> I wanted to give a shout out actually to Candace Halcrow of Rebelina. Um, back in the day when Indigenous fashion was just kind of starting up, she was one of my biggest inspirations. There was this first, one of the first major call outs that happened was with Paul Frank. He had uh, this really awful like uh, war party themed thing going on. And then he put out a collection of like very culturally appropriated apparel and he was publicly called out for the first time. This was, must've been like 10 or 11 years ago, maybe. Yeah. Around there. And the way that he fixed it was he hired four indigenous designers who were up and coming at the time. And Candace Hellcrow's from like a small town right around where I'm from. And her beadwork was just taking off. And, uh, she was one of the first designers to create a product that really like took off globally, not just within like Turtle Island indigenous community, but everybody was resonating with the beadwork that she did on the sunglasses. So I really, I really admired her because she, she, she got out there as Métis woman from Northern Saskatchewan and her designs have been all over the world and um, she's stuck to it. You know, she's still, she's still doing the thing and, um, it goes in waves, you know, the way creativity works and the way that people move through the space of business and passion and love. And I love the way that Candace has, has, has gone through that. She's really inspires me. Um, there's tons of people yeah. that inspire me, like tons, like music, artists, philosophers, like there's just lots of inspiration out there. <laughs> Yeah, it comes from everywhere, for mm -hmm. sure. You guys are inspiring. I love what you do. I love that you have this community and you've built this space where you support each other. That's inspiring. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could like name just famous people in that way because there's so much inspiration in everything. You know, you go online and you see people caring for each other and supporting each other. That's inspirational. Anybody who's doing that thing. I have these, um, they're not like actual Rebelina. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I probably got them like about, yeah, about 10 years ago or like maybe nine years ago. So it's probably like the wave after all the, the powwow booths that were inspired by her sunglasses. <laughs> right on. Those are so bougie. Like you just feel like bam, and <laughs> you put them on. I bet. <laughs> um. So, do any of you, like Josh, Gabby, Harmony, Danny, you guys have questions? <laughs> I have a question. I um. So a few weeks ago, we interviewed uh, um Dusty from Mobilize out in Edmonton, and I asked him a question. I guess a kind of the same question I wanted to ask you guys was like. He, he mentioned about like some of his uh i guess inspiration for designs so i know you kind of mentioned it was about like contemporary meets traditional and um so i asked dusty kind of like what like what inspires like the like the colors and like when i when i see the beadwork gabby's got so many different uh styles of your beadwork which is <laughs> in front of me this actually. is like what josh was <laughs> asking about yeah but like <laughs> I just, yeah. I guess I, 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 the question I'm trying to ask is like, <laughs> where do you get like the, the ideas or the inspirations for like the colors and just like, I don't know, like they're just like things I've never seen. So going to powwows, you don't see this kind of style of beadwork or earrings <laughs> so much when I was younger, but 
just like where do where do those ideas come from like and yeah so that's kind of my question if that makes sense <laughs> yeah no it's a good question chanel, chanel. let's not talk about chanel <laughs> um well i always try to create something a little bit different when i'm beating um and I've always been really inspired by edge work. Actually, Summer Peters is one of my favorite beaters ever. She used to do like um, stones around the edge. And it was just, I had never seen people edge like that before. And I thought, well, this is something that I could do. I could play with scale of beads. Um, when I started beading, it was just a lot of the same kind of, like there was a, there was a style of edging that everybody seemed to do a version of. And I wanted to try to do something different. And I think in the bead world, it's always about, um, I was told like when I was making the outfit that you have to be really careful, you know, you can't use the same colors as other people. And there's a lot of like family designs and stuff like that. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to play with beads in size and scale and, and material so that I was creating a contemporary kind of everything kind of beadwork that just was its own thing. And it wasn't, I didn't want to worry about, you know, family designs or sacred things or anything like that. I just wanted to play with color and scale. So it was just like thinking about the old designs, you know, that Kuka made and that um, a lot of our, our people, like different styles of florals and whatnot, just um, making a contemporary version of them. That was the, that was the whole thing behind the design. And um, just played with colors as I saw them and was inspired. I, I the sky. I'm always trying to be the sky. Alex tells me I can actually take a picture of the sky now, and you can put it into this app, and it tells you what Pantone colors they are. <laughs> so I can actually like buy the beads now and bead the sky. But yeah, that's nature. Going outside and just looking at color and light filtering through different things and. You know when you close your eyes and it turns different colors when you're looking at the sun like there's the really yellow and I, those are my inspirations for how i put things together <laughs> how about you alex what about your beadwork inspiration for the designs oh everywhere basically like taking the iconic iconography yeah out of like everything and then putting a twist on it and experimenting with it pretty much yeah we have these unreleased collections alex keeps coming back to what we call the coin so they're these little you haven't probably seen them yet but they're um we have a, a kichisabe that's going to be coming out on a coin and a thunderbird and what else is there Turtle, turtle. Yeah, like cutouts. So the al abalone. <laughs> yeah, abalone. I, I keep forgetting how to pronounce that. We just like take out the cutouts of the al <laughs> abalone, <laughs> and then we just like um, glue it back. It looks really cool. Can't wait to release them. Yeah, they're gonna be good. <laughs> you um, I have these ones. I was gonna show like. Because I think it's important, like how you're saying, like, like it, it's really cool to like, like think about, you know, like how our ancestors created their their fashion and everything, but mm -hmm. also to remember, like we're we're here today, and like it's cool to see how we recreate things around us right now. And so, like, I have these ones. <laughs> Those are like hey <laughs> <laughs> ships. <laughs> For me, it's like Sailor Moon. <laughs> okay. I'm like, I love Sailor Moon. <laughs> but then there's also this. This one is like, this one is one that you guys created for me. Um, because like, like as a Métis person, you know, like the kind of thing you always see Métis folks is there's always a sash. And it's like, that's cool, but like, we can like express ourselves or show our identity in other ways. And like, so that's what these earrings, they're like a custom, custom made earrings to do that. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, everything you guys are talking mm -hmm. about is, is so dead on and mm -hmm. it's really appreciated. 
Thank you. We we love making things that resonate with people. That's the whole point, you know, is just to have have it have it matter to somebody. And the idea behind the whole like using the acrylics is that, that that's actually something that lasts a really long time if you take care of it. And I think our ancestors were people that, you know, they took care of the things that were important, their adornments and stuff and uh, passed them along. Mm -hmm. The Métis um, florals that I made for you, Gabby, those were while we were like jamming out with the whole sash, we were like, loving the sash and the colors and it was so inspiring and there was this um dancer what's her name Hunger? no uh night night sun i tp scop his sim night sun night sun yeah mm -hmm. i saw her um dance and she wore this like contemporary version of a like a jigging outfit and it was really cool to see that like like a, a leather jacket with the sash and some other stuff going on. It was, it was inspiring to see that contemporary twist on the, the Métis look. Do you, does anybody dance? Does anyone, Jake? <laughs> Wasn't she making something for her? Um, Are you guys, uh, does everybody dance powwow or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. Powell is a huge, huge inspiration too. My goodness. Um, so anybody else? No questions? Oh, I have a question. Um, just for like two business indigenous entrepreneurs. Um, how do you like maintain your like personal and professional friendship? Because you're both like running a business together. So it's kind of interesting how you like you made because you guys both seem like kindred spirits <laughs> it takes a lot of love and communication and a lot of a lot of talking yeah <laughs> we just realized that we um if we ever we have a disagreement we uh, we're actually saying the same thing but in different ways it, my my sister rebecca was sitting with us and she's like you guys are saying the same thing just in different ways and we realize we do that a lot so it's just about like having that communication and being open to it and understanding each other um, because we're we're like business partners but we're also life partners as well <laughs> it's all blurred though the whole COVID has taught us how to separate our life into different rooms at least <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> we moved just at the at the beginning and, and it was like wow our whole house is indie city and we needed to learn how to have like you know the bedroom is a sacred space the living room is a place to gather the office is where you talk about business and the kitchen table is where you have food with your family and before covid we were like living in all those houses in one and what we needed to do was just just have that those boundaries in those spaces Mm -hmm. I think that's been a major um, co contribution to the success of the business and then the, the, the personal life as well. Yeah, it's been like figuring out the balance, right? Not trying to talk about business before coffee and breakfast. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just basically finding a balance and finding time to to d discuss certain things, you know, so then there is like sectors of our relationship and of our business so there's a time and space for everything for each conversation basically wow Jimmy Gretch I totally got that vibe um of your connection and like I was like wow they remind me of Josh and Gabby <laughs> I feel like they could also answer the same question too <laughs> Danny, do you have a question in mind? Yeah, not really a question, but um, yeah, uh, I met Angel last year in Calgary, and I mentioned how I had all the bison horns and almost all my spirit colors, and so she drove home and got the last pair of things. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have all of them. Oh my God. <laughs> So I thought that was really cool, um, but also like really cool to see queer women in 
like such a big industry. I don't know how to say that, but yeah, really cool to see um, indigenous queer love and like mixed with indigenous fashion. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Danny, show show them again. I want to get it on video. I'm um, in. I have to I have to do it again. Wait. I had a way of holding it. And now I can't do it. Oh no. Oh. Those are pretty colors together. Mm hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, so I have a like when we were in Calgary, I got two from you. So we got I got these ones, like the ones you were just talking about. Oh, yes. oh those are unreleased. Yeah, yeah those yeah. are just, I haven't yeah. released them yet. <laughs> um, but my question was gonna be, are you making them like in every color? Yes. Yeah. So like pink? Yeah, hot pink. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love these and like I love wearing your guys' products because like when we were traveling my ears were hurting because <laughs> like I was wearing heavy earrings so then I just stopped wearing earrings and then after Calgary I started wearing earrings because I'm like these are light enough to just like have on you know they don't murder my ears but <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions anything to say uh yeah i was wondering uh i know you talked a little bit about it uh but just like when you were at school was there like a lot of indigenous people i know there's like a really huge um not a good a uh, large market for indigenous fashion so maybe if you could talk a little bit more about that before we all head out yeah yeah um so the program that i took at sait it was called on uh, new media production and design. And I think there was maybe like just a handful of indigenous in our whole program for the whole two years. Um, yeah, there's, there's not enough representation definitely in um, the schools in Calgary for indigenous. There's, not a lot of representation of Indigenous in Calgary in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think everybody's doing a little bit better, but there's so many out there, you know, there's, there's a lot of really talented folks that I think need um, mm -hmm. more support in where, where, where we live, at least. Yeah, there's one thing that we're actually working on is that we want to come up with a scholarship or um, send proceeds to some um, scholarship for indigenous um, youth in Calgary. We're just trying to figure out how that's gonna look and how is it gonna work. And we plan on bringing on some mentors to help with that so they could have their designs on our, on our brand so they could help us raise funds for um, indigenous scholar, scholarships. Because there's definitely needs to be more um, yeah, indigenous representation in, in the schools and second post. <clears throat> we were really, we, we actually, I think Dusty just um, from Mobilize just announced something like that. Like he's doing a design scholarship with some youth. And we were talking about that a few months ago and we were thinking about how Cheekbone has been doing the, her scholarship as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to us to like give back. And I think what's, we um, figure out exactly how we want to go about this. It's something that we're going to roll out mm -hmm. continually. And working with, um, it, what I learned over my years is that we talk about youth in the context of like teenagers for the most part, but in Indigenous communities, I think youth is like, 35 up like to 35, 35 you know mm -hmm. like we're all still I just turned 36 so I'm officially an adult <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this <laughs> I'm still a youth <laughs> <laughs> it's just playing in the mud yesterday so <laughs> no grown-ups here <laughs> <clears throat>
but yeah, yeah. giving back and um, creating opportunities for others to kind of be part of the maker community that we've become part of and to learn different skills like 3d printing and laser mm -hmm. cutting and beading and fashion design and like going through all of it with some folks that's even that's next. like how to set up a, a website you know yeah. would be so like beneficial to like people to sell their their art you know our people rather than like have it appro appropriated and def like education's the new buffalo that's what my uncle used to say to me education is huge it, it gets you places you know yeah <clears throat> um yeah i was wondering like um because like myself like i'm i'm metis from the settlements but i'm like i live here in ottawa and so i'm like far away from my homelands and um i'm on algonquin territory and so as i i feel like you both have a similar experience um mm -hmm. being like background from michif nishnabek neheao but living in like Blackfoot territory. <laughs> so I was wondering like how how you maintain your your origins or your cultures but also respecting the territory that you live on. Mm. Mm, good question. That is a good question. Um, I kind of assimilated into Treaty 7 territory very well and mm -hmm. amongst everybody. Um, I it was through their, the, the Treaty 7 community that I actually came back to my own identity and becoming a proud Nihiao Square in that space. It was, uh, it was very different in, in Calgary where um, there was, in the North, it was more of, of the way to be was to, to be colonized and to assimilate into society in that way. And I found that I, there wasn't a lot of, um, there was nowhere to go and like have a sweat and pray in the community that I grew up on, the Flying Dust First Nation. And um, when I came to Treaty 7, I was taking a program at Mount Royal and there was, there was a program for, um, for indigenous, indigenous folks, the Aboriginal education program. And I found so many people that were just kindred and they brought me into the community and it was like this reclamation of my identity and my pride in myself as a woman, as a Nihiao. And uh, there was never like discrimination against me being Cree and Blackfoot country. It was just like, we're all indigenous here. And, mm -hmm. and it, was, uh, it was empowering to like um, learn of my identity through just being part of the the Blackfoot um, community and the Stony Nakoda community. Mm -hmm. They brought me back to myself, I guess is what it, how it went. Yeah, like I grew up hearing there was like um, a, a rivalry between Blackfoots and Crees, right? And all the jokes. But to be honest, I've never really experienced it. Like we all are just like brothers and sisters at the end of the day, like we're, yeah, and um, I, I just checked out the census report, and there was like thousands of Crees in Calgary, and just a few hundred of the Treaty 7, so I'm like, okay, well, there's a big representation here. Maybe there should be a center for, like, Cree people, you know, so we could get together and learn some Cree words, right? <laughs> Talk some Cree. Yeah, and... Yeah, it's interesting because, like, I find Calgary is, like, a hub. I don't know if you know, we have, like, um, two rivers. Um, we have the Bow River and the Albo River, and we're in Meats downtown. That used to be, like, ancient grounds for meeting grounds. And we, it's so funny because there's so different nations that surround that hub. It's almost like it's meant to be this transit city, you know? it's meant to have all these different nations meet, you know? Just like the Forks in Winnipeg, it used to be an ancient ground for the meeting people for the Niihau. And I don't know, I feel like maybe that's where the direction it's going, you know? It's like, it, it's gonna be like, kind of like a universal, it feels like a universal territory, you know? For different tribes. Um, like a crossing point. Yeah, yeah. 
everybody. Yeah, it was crazy. There was like 4,000 Crees in Calgary. And <laughs> it's funny though, in their land acknowledgement, they actually, they acknowledge like the Sutina, the Kainai, the Bikani, the Black, uh, the Siksika, the Suti uh, Stony Nakoda, Bear's Paw, Eden Valley, and Morley. They, 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 and then they, the Métis local, I'm not sure what the number is, but they acknowledge all of those except for the, they don't they leave Cree out of there. It, who like, like is a huge leave. representation in Calgary. <laughs> like for, it's like wh when are we gonna talk about that? You know? <laughs> it's so funny. I was like, as soon as I heard that on our local uh, university um radio station, I was like, okay, I think we need to make a post about this. About the Crees in Calgary. Like we're excluded. We got a okay. huge gang here, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there actually used to be a Métis settlement not too far from Calgary uh like Marlboro Marlboro I can never say that properly yeah. Like, Marlboro. <laughs> 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 yeah that used to be a Métis settlement but then um yeah. from what I know what happened is it got overrun by uh, settlers and so you probably mm -hmm. know it as like a small little like white town um but yeah, so yeah, there was lots of like even Métis folks from the settlements down that way. Huh. I didn't know that. That's neat. Marlboro <laughs> like a community in or, like it's one of the communities in Calgary. It's kind of like the hood, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a town. Maybe I don't outside know. Outside of Calgary, I've never. Yeah, that. yeah. There's like a little town, like not yeah. not probably not the one you're talking mm -hmm. about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <A little> <laughs> Very cool. Mika Chai Hai. Thanks for for sharing those answers. Thank you. Thanks for having us, you guys. It was good to chat. A little out of our, our element, but um happy to be here. <laughs> okay, so we're just gonna do a closing like circle. Well green. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're gonna end the recording now. But thanks so much for coming to share with all of us and uh people that couldn't come tonight are still going to get to see it they're going to have the opportunity to hear what you guys had to say um but miigwech thank you